Hello, welcome to my channel. Um, I'm very, very proud to um, be presenting something a bit different for you today because I have an interview with the best selling author of this book, The Appeal, Janice Hallett. Um, and we're talking about all aspects of writing from uh, initial inspiration to getting your first novel published and finding an agent and progressing in the industry. Yeah, and I think you'll find out a fascinating little talk. Uh, I've known about Janice for quite a long time because weirdly um, we are connected um, from dim and distant past. I used to be in a running club with her partner uh, many years ago and I remember him telling me actually as we were running around the track. Yeah, I told him about my writing and he said, oh yes, my, uh, my partner's a writer. You don't think much of it because there are many more writers out there than can ever be published. Little did I know that um, Janice would turn out to be a very successful and very talented author. And if you haven't read The Appeal, I would heartily recommend it. It's a fascinating book. It's written in the form of um, emails and uh, conversation transcripts uh, between characters in an amateur dramatics company. And one of their members is murdered. Anyway, it's a massive success. Uh, Sunday Times Crime Book of the Year well recommended. She's now to her third novel. So without further ado, without further preamble from me, I present my conversation with Janice Hallett. Um, so I mean the first, I will do a little intro into you and you know uh, why we're talking but I just thought it, maybe you could start with a little preamble about how what your writing journey is uh, up until the point where you wrote The Appeal. Up to the pill. Wow, how long have you got? Because I was <laughs> um, 52 when the appeal was published. So I've got 52 mm. years of my writing career to get through. So it was a long time. Mm. Any Anybody listening to your podcast who is not young anymore, um, please be heartened by my story because, you know, there's a, anyone can make it. You don't have to mm. be young uh, to be a writer. And in fact, um, experience is a good thing. I mean, I started off writing, obviously I learned to write when I was six and I always excelled at English and those sorts of subjects at school. Mm. But there wasn't really a clear career path for someone who enjoyed writing and who wanted to do it for a living. And I did write a novel when I was about 20, my angst-ridden mm. um, teenage novel that I think we all write at about yeah. that age. <laughs> and um, it really didn't go anywhere. And thank goodness, because I wouldn't have liked that to have been my first novel really thinking back on it mm. um, but then I, I kind of put those thoughts aside and pursued um, a regular career and that was in magazines in trends so nothing particularly glamorous although on the outside it might have appeared to be because I was writing about beauty products and um, beauty retail industry really uh, which I know I, I loved it for many years but eventually you know when you've mm. done something for so long that it wears thin a bit, doesn't it? I mean, for 15 yeah. years, I, I worked in magazines. Um, Fancy to change. And all my life, I've been doing amateur drama. And mm. it so happened that a, a friend, Sharon, and I, we wrote a play at around that time that I was being disillusioned with my work. We wrote a play and I stopped work as the amateur drama group was putting that play on. Mm. So that proved to be quite a catalyst for me to see my work in front of an audience I mean yeah. it's addictive when you hear that first laugh and when you see an audience engaging with your work uh, and that moment really has led to this one here talking mm. to you because um, from that moment I knew that that was what I wanted to pursue and so I did and, and that involved first of all doing an MA in mm. film screenwriting for film and TV um, after which I'd hooked up with a director who'd advertised mm. for a playwright to rewrite his film script uh, and then Carl Tibbetts and I worked together for the next I dread to think how many years in total but the following three years after that we um we were working on one particular film called Retreat mm. and luckily we were lucky to have that actually made which is amazing uh, for the film industry film industry um I won't say in decline because that's not um, the right word but I would say very difficult um, to get things made and we just about managed to get retreat out there with a stellar cast and mm. good, good reviews you know so that was great um, that was 2011 
so I've got I'm up to 2011 now so I've written a film <laughs> co-written a film I should say co-written it and um, I'm wanting to write more for the screen uh, so I continue for a while writing with Carl because our relationship is good and um, I create we bounce off each other creatively uh, but the years roll by and mm. we don't manage to get anything else off the ground uh, that retreat remains my only thing my only sort of success really uh, and I still can't get an agent this is a uh, kind of right. interesting you talked about getting mm. an agent uh, retreat was out and I still couldn't get an agent uh, yeah. I don't know I don't know why um, you might if you interview an agent perhaps explain why you know a, a success doesn't necessarily um, get you an agent I don't mm. I don't know but I didn't um, so I, we roll on Carl and I eventually work out that we're not going to get anywhere right in screenplays together um the film industry is such that the kind of films we wrote weren't being made so around 2013 I think it was 2014 maybe uh, we go our separate ways creatively and I, I decide to uh, make a a good go of trying to get into the UK TV um market and I, I'd really like to have um written for soaps and continuing dramas mm. and um returning dramas I really fancied um, getting my hands into Midsummer and writing writing that. Very, very difficult to get into. And um, I think as as um, the years rolled by again, it got to 2018 and I hadn't succeeded. So this is about five years of trying. Yeah. And I did every scheme. I did every, I won, won most competitions that there were to win. Um, I, I knew a lot of people. In fact, I've been in development with things. Um, but I just hadn't had anything done. And I was on another scheme and it was actually a scheme for um, screenwriters who hadn't got anywhere. Um, so it was kind of sad. I see I, things were crossing my mind. Is this going to be the end? Is this the end mm. of me trying to do this? What will I do now? Um, when I was given a mentor and that was Cameron Roach, um, ah. who at the time was assistant director of drama or assistant commissioner of drama at Sky TV. Uh, he, we had a couple of meetings and, and my main um, bugbear, I suppose, at the time, the main thing that I brought to him was that I wasn't getting my story or my ideas out there. You know, it's, in years, I just hadn't got into TV. Chances are I wasn't going to be. I was 49 by then. So, you know, I was at the end of the road. Uh, and he suggested it shouldn't make a difference though should it really novel. <laughs> you think it shouldn't make a difference no and it shouldn't um mm. but the world is what it is isn't it i mean it is very mm. um a, it's a young industry tv um and it's a, a young kind of world you know that's sometimes for good reason and but where does it leave you if you've got to the age that we have and you, mm. you haven't achieved your dreams or you haven't got where you want to be um so i was at that stage he suggested writing a novel because he said, um, if you write a novel, that story will be out there or you could get it out there or try and get it out there. And that could then kickstart your screenwriting mm. career. Uh, so first of all, it sounded as if he was telling me to give up screenwriting. Uh, but I thought about it a bit more. And, um, you know, he wasn't really. He was just telling me to not keep doing the same thing mm. and expect a different result. Um, so I... I, I had nothing to lose. I had literally nothing. So I shut down final draft. I opened Word and I started writing The Appeal because The Appeal was the story I'd been thinking about to do for mm. my next spec script, my next screenplay. I thought, well, mm. I've got these, this idea uh, that I want to explore. And why don't I try this novel and make it about emails that are flying mm. behind the scenes between my characters in this story? I have to think about so I set off I set off writing it and yeah I was gonna, I was gonna ask later. about sorry I, I was gonna ask about that particular before we move on the um epistolary format because that's a yeah, very on. unusual oblique choice and mm -hmm. it obviously there used to be a you know grand tradition of epistolary novels uh, as a mode and I was wondering yeah. why specifically um because some would some might argue that uh, it makes it um you know, that it makes it more of a challenge to an editor or agent because it's so unusual. So I was wondering why you chose to go with that format. I chose that format because I didn't think about it at all. I didn't think about all <laughs> any of those things that might have stopped me writing it. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've 
read the classics and I did an English degree, so I was familiar mm. with the Victorian epistolary novels, but I wasn't familiar with recent ones at all. Mm. Um, I just thought, well, that'd be nice. I quite enjoy email communication myself. Mm. Uh, I enjoy re- reading emails from other people. So why not? I thought I'd, I could get character across with people writing and mm. people keeping secrets from each other and talking behind people's backs. It seemed quite a nice way to overhear characters talking mm. i didn't really think much about it and i think ha- if i had i'd have thought well that's too difficult yeah it's, it's also kind of a theatrical device because obviously in a play you're quite frequently having different arrangements of characters having conversations and occasionally somebody walking in and hearing something they shouldn't mm. so maybe it does sort of link link back to your experience in amdram and the other thing i was thinking is um it allows all your characters to be unreliable narrators because nobody's <laughs> nobody's telling the whole truth or they're telling one version of the truth to this person and then another version of the truth to someone else. And I think that's one of the right. appeal of the appeal. Is, um, Definitely. Yeah. We're different people with different people. Whoever mm. we're with, we're, we become different. So, and I think the appeal sh- uh, shines a light on that. I know one thing that I kept a very close um, hold of when I was writing the appeal and when I was editing it was mm. how each character says hello and goodbye to each other character because mm. that to me was was pivotal to how how that story w- was developed in that format and how on the on the kind of ca- the character level that I was working at I suppose so yeah it's um yeah. there's so many truths that we all well, have yes uh, uh, I once got I once got in trouble with a especially touchy friend I would say by signing off an important emotional email with just my initials because she said oh Oh. It just sounds like you're being like offhand about it, but I, to me, it's no. It's a sign of intimacy, you know. I don't. You know who I am. I don't need to use my whole name, you know. <laughs> so yeah, you can, you can give away more than you think you are giving away. Um, True. So yeah. yeah. So um, obviously you chose the Amdram world, which you know fits in with the old adage of write what you know, um, and and that comes across very strongly in the book. But um, I mean, I've had limited experience with Amdram, but uh, yeah, it does seem like it's a world of people who take things incredibly seriously but also you know there's a lot of rivalries there's a lot of internecine conflict you know there's always one person who seems to get a lion's share of the roles because they're probably better you know than <laughs> it's the like others. life and am- yeah. an amateur drama group is a microcosm of the world and it's the yeah. people and uh, I, the one thing I love, you say people take it very seriously. I love that about mm. amateur drama, that all these people come together for a hobby, but it's so important. It has to be right and it has to be good because you're putting it on in front of an audience. And that's that need for it to be good and for things mm. to go well and for things to go right is what gives amateur drama um, the stakes, the yeah. high stakes that it has. It's almost, and, when you um, watch as an audience, yeah, it's, my it's almost... Yeah, and it's like meta drama because as an audience member watching this, you're sort of crossing your fingers that everyone remembers their lines because you know it's been pulled together <laughs> in a matter of weeks and they've hardly had any rehearsal time probably on in the venue. Yeah. So you're always sort of thinking, oh God, I hope it just comes off and, and it works and nobody forgets their lines <laughs> and falls off the stage, whatever. So, um, and yeah, there, there are so many layers. It's a bit of an onion of a novel because you've obviously you've got mm. the framing device of the emails You've got another kind of another framing device of the two um, uh, detectives, Ollie and Charlotte, who are yeah. um, sort of our eyes and ears for well, or maybe I don't, yeah, maybe you could just explain why you chose to to have them in it because <laughs> theoretically you could have just yeah. missed them out completely. I suppose theoretically, what um, I found out actually after I'd written the appeal is that. Um, there's a legal process called, mm. um, I think it's e-discovery, where mm. all the emails and communications of uh, a case are printed out and lawyers have to read them and lawyers mm. and legal people involved in that case have to go through them all. And that's exactly what these two lawyers are doing um, with this and they're communicating with each other and discussing the case. Now, I came up with them as a kind of Greek chorus very mm. early on. Um, I'm not sure... Why I think in my head was the idea that there had to be a reason why these emails were printed out and put together for us to read. And I I think somewhere there came the thought that they've been printed out for someone else to read. And we're also seeing their response to it. Yeah. I I think um, that's where they came from. 
Yeah. And I find I find in reading it, it does help because it sort of breaks up. I mean, I found it a very challenging read because because it was it's framed as a kind of can the a who done it for the reader. Yeah. That um and because there's so many characters, um, I have to stop and take stock. So it's very useful to have both the personas dramatic at the beginning, but also these these two characters who are sort of outside the story, who kind of drop little clues, um, things they've figured out, things that they think are the case, and then they have their boss who's also um, come to his own conclusions. So it, it um, I, I had a question about marketing, which would make sound like we're jumping the <laughs> jumping to the end of the story first, but. <laughs> because the whole thing is framed, you know, can you uncover the truth? Um, I was wondering, did that come, did that idea of making it sort of interactive to that extent come in early or is that more of a sort of marketing angle? Um, no, I, early on, I was, I quite liked the interactive nature and the, the feeling that we were kind of eavesdropping mm. and um, we had to work things out ourselves because uh, what, I suppose what a lot of novels do is tell you what to think. They'll they'll describe a character, what they look like, what they're wearing, and that will reflect mm. their character and their motivation sometimes. I mean, the baddies are always bad and the goodies are good. Um, but this one, I didn't want that really. I wanted the reader mm. to identify with everybody and also try and through that work out who was good, who was bad. Mm. Um, so that we all jump into everybody's shoes whenever we read their email so I, I wanted that level of interactivity and as uh, Femi and Charlotte went along as I wrote them reading mm. this material I, I kind of realized then that this is going to be quite immersive and interactive mm. for the reader so once I'd finished it I mean that was um, it wasn't um, dreamt up by the marketing people that was already mm. um, I won't say my intention before I started but soon after I started that became a driving force behind the narrative yeah, and it does. It makes you read in a different way um, because I you can't just sort of take a back seat and just let things wash over you. Uh, <laughs> you do have to, uh, which is why it took me several sort of large gulps. I mean, I did read it, and <laughs> I found myself at one o'clock in the morning going, "I'm far too tired. I can't." I feel like I'm in the position of one of these detectives. I can't. I can't go on. I need to take yeah. a few. It's your job so, um, to do it. So find, yeah. find out who who done it. Exactly. Um, so I think I read something somewhere where you said that you're, this is the, you know, the great writer's question, that you're more of a pantser than a plotter. So how yeah. on earth does that yeah. work with writing a whodunit? <laughs> I know. Well, um, I am a pantser. Uh, I start, um, I, I launch off into writing. I don't make mm. many plans, if any. And um, I get to the end of my first draft. And that's when the kind of the hard work begins, if you like, because that's, the, the novel I finish is almost never the one that I've started. Hmm. So I have to then go back. Uh, if I haven't been going back, you know, as I've been going along and alter the beginning to fit the end or to fit hmm. different twists that I've, I've worked out along the way. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, it's just doing it the other way around, isn't it? I'm a reverse engineer. And also yeah. I have a bigger job um, at the first edit stage, the structural edit, which is the, the version I get back or the changes and notes I get back hmm. after my editor has seen it for the first time. They're the biggest changes. And there's certainly a lot of hard work. I mean, for Twyford Code, um, three months that took me to mm. structurally, structurally edit. Um, the appeal wasn't quite so long, nor my third novel. Um, quite sorry, I know we're jumping ahead a bit to mm. Twyford. But um, yes, yeah, so that's a big stage too. I'm not sure I would get such a lot of work at those stages if I'd planned in advance I think a lot of things mm. would have been sorted in advance so it's all swings and roundabouts but yeah, yeah. I find um, plotting takes the joy out of yeah. the writing and the exploring and the getting to know the characters and and seeing where they lead me that's just the joy of writing for me yeah the, the, the fun is when you literally don't know what the character is going to say or do next and you just have to follow them around until something yeah. interesting happens that's um, right but as as I'm finding myself with a time travel narrative where there are wow. loops, multiple characters with loops of time, it's perhaps the, the worst possible strategy <laughs> to adopt. But like you, I've, ha I've had a raft of editorial notes from an independent. I did for the first time, I used an independent editor on this particular okay. novel that I'm trying to sell. Yeah. So um, I have a lot of work to do, but um, it's good. It's, it's been a really useful process, painful, but useful, I think. It's um, painful and it's hard work, but at the end, mm. you get something better. 
and that's the, that's the motivation that's what my eyes are always on uh, so yeah I, I i quite like that stage because i know mm. um the manuscript is moving on and it's moving in the yeah. right direction uh, yeah. so yeah it's uh, but yeah it's tough it's hard work and so were you oh, okay two two practical questions first question is did you have an agent uh, before you uh, uh wrote the novel or did you find one having written it I um this is my agent's story I already had um a, a screenwriting agent hmm. uh, I had Lucy Fawcett at Shield Land uh, when oh. I started writing the appeal I'd had her for about three years then hmm. um but I'd not had particular particularly had much tv work or any um so you know I think I was a bit, you know charity case for her she was probably claiming gift aid for me <laughs> um but um yeah so I already had my agent um but of course she's a screenwriting agent so she doesn't mm. represent books luckily the same agency does represent books not mm. not the case with all agencies uh so she passed on my um manuscript of the appeal to Guy Banks that's shield mm. land so that was quite an easy transition that was easy for me to get my my book agent it was very hard to get an agent to begin with um yeah I, yeah I think I got Lucy in 2015 so that's four years after I had the retreat made um mm. you know it's soul destroying yeah, trying to it is, find, it is. finding I mean, an I, agent I say it's like finding a life partner it's there's something yeah. magic and you can't and then you have to find, um, well, I mean, then they have to find you an editor, of course. So that's the next stage of it. So yeah. um, how did that process work? Did you have to try a lot of publishers or, or did, was it sort of immediately picked up? I found I, I was kind of divorced from that process. I'm not really interested mm. in hearing how many people have rejected my manuscript. So I would never <laughs> yeah, ask. Fair enough. I'll just ha yeah. hand it over to Gaia and All right. she'll okay. let me know if anything good happens. And mm. it did. <laughs> Luckily it did. All and right. I kind of think the amount of time that she had it um, before I was talking then to Viper, uh, who eventually optioned it, or not optioned, I'm using screenwriting terms. They yeah. um, bought it, effect, bought, it, bought it and gave me a two book deal. Um, mm. It was about six months, I think. All right. Roughly, That's so presumably, yeah. yep, people must have rejected it. I'm pretty sure I'm not in, under any illusion they didn't. But I know there were a few people who were yeah. interested. Uh, so that was I, good too. Well, I did a little video on um, on rejection, uh, on how to deal with it. And I looked, started looking into how many publishers rejected various novels and pretty much everything that you've ever heard of yeah. has been rejected multiple times <laughs> before it's picked up. And some an astonishing number of times, and it just makes you under yeah. realize how how much perseverance is vital. Because if you've had your book rejected by fifty editors or fifty agents, and you're still sending it out, you have to have a lot of self belief. Um, you do. I would say if, it's been, if the same work has been rejected by so many people, start writing something else. Yeah, because you'll absolutely. have learned loads from writing that. Write something else, and later on in your career, you can come back to that if you love it yeah. and rewrite it or represent it but yeah I mean someone asked me the other day how many times have you been rejected as a writer and I had to say it must be in the thousands mm. from you know all sorts of uh, people and agencies uh, playing um, play things tv things film things um, book things right you know everything mm. Put, add them all together and it is in the thousands and it's one thing it's something you have to learn to live with as a writer but also I would say uh, at the risk of sounding cavalier, you have to get over it as well, because yeah. once you are published, you get rejection on a different level. And that's um, bad reviews, bad mm. reviews on Amazon and Goodreads and NetGalley. Uh, you'll read everything negative about your work if just in reading a few reviews. So it helps if you've completely Teflon coated yeah. when it comes to I, uh, criticism and rejection. It really helps. I find it harder with because. Like yourself, I've had, I've had one film produced <laughs> and it yep. didn't get of a course, major. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, I know I've uh, very much um, preaching to the converted on that one. But, uh, yeah, I, the rejection in terms of the, re the reviews for my film, that was brutal, you know. Mm -hmm. And weirdly enough, I got the two best reviews and they weren't exactly stellar reviews from Sight and Sound and Best magazine. So, like, <laughs> a throwaway sort of... Uh, magazine you drink while you know with, uh, read while yeah. drinking your tea or whatever else and 
the august publication of the BFI. And everyone else sort of seemed to hate it. But anyway, you know, you move on. You do other things. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, I mean, Retreat got some scathing hmm. reviews. We had one review, and I can't, uh, I can't, don't even care to remember which magazine. I think it's yeah. an American one. Literally took our list of um, people who worked on the film, um, the credits, and literally slammed everybody by name. God. It was like <laughs> awful. It was the worst review of any film I've ever read, and it, that was the film that yeah. I'd co-written. I mean, I think reviewers have yeah. to be honest, but it does seem they. It would be nice if they could make some allowance for the first movie made by a writer or director, <laughs> given how nearly impossible it is to make get a film together, uh, especially yeah, yeah, in the UK, absolutely. where we don't really have, as you say, we don't have an, we have a cottage industry, maybe, and we have an amazing service yeah. industry and an industry of really talented technicians and professionals. What we don't really have is the money, the investment, the uh, equity that funds yeah. uh, films. We don't have studios. We have the BBC, um, Channel 4, I suppose Sky. And now I suppose maybe it's getting better because we've got net, you know Netflix, Amazon, people coming in and picking up bits of talent here and there. But for a long time, it was, if you got a film made, it's just, uh, you know, you're at the top of the pinnacle of a pyramid of, yeah. of, of difficulty. Yeah, so, people um, work for, for years in, in the industry and don't ever see their work made. This is certainly true of writers. Yeah. And you get to be quite an old hand and a trusted hand, but you've never seen your work in front of an audience or on screen. And yeah, that's, that that's be, terrible, oh, really. Oh, dear. We've got 10 minutes left. I just have to take this oh, online message. Oh, my goodness. Screen. Sorry. Have I been, have I been rabbiting <laughs> no, it's all right. It's quite all right. No, it's, it's been very, very helpful and useful. Um, so what, should, what vital questions do I need to ask you? Let's get on to your second book, because oh, well. um, obviously Bye. when you I, I haven't I, I, I haven't read this one because I'm waiting for it to come out paperback. Um, oh, because I have yeah. a very large, I have a very large gilt pile everywhere around my house of books <laughs> I haven't yet got to, but well, I'm looking forward to it. It's in paperback on, I think it's July 21st, ah, available to great. pre-order, however you like to buy your books, it's available now, but to pre-order. So, and yeah, I'm particularly interested because I, I used to read a lot of Enid Blyton when I was a kid, so I know that you've, it's a sort of homage uh -huh. in a way to some of that um, era of um, childhood yeah. novels. And you've also uh, found another way to it investigate is. the sort of epistolary um, style in this one, haven't you? It oh. is. It's um, a different, again, it's not um, mm. emails, it's not mm. um, letters, but it is a, a diary, a verbal diary that my lead character has made. He can't mm. read or write. Um, he can't read very well and he definitely can't write. So he's recording his voice. He's... Um, going on an investigation into something that happened in his childhood mm. um, but to record it he he has to talk and that's what we're reading we're reading automatic transcriptions mm. of 200 voice files right so that's, so that's uh, the, sounds fascinating because i think you obviously you have to have the um do you have the ums and ahs or is it edited you know so it's a little uh, bit better it, it will re it will reproduce the ums and ahs and it will right um, you get a key a key at the beginning to hmm. let you know what it's um the little symbols that it show you so that you know hmm. when someone is hesitating and you know when they oh, breathe right, okay. in and you know when wow. they breathe out which is um and it, that's actually i didn't make that up that's a there, i found a key online there's a book about hmm. how to represent speech in its entirety um wow. on paper that's with all the in breaths, out breaths, all this mm. hesitation and so on, how to represent that. And so I used that key and adapted it for this. So mm. as you read, I mean, it's called the Twyford Code. And by the time you've read that book, you've been reading without realizing it numerous codes of all sorts. Right. Um, okay. From co Cockney rhyming slang to, to this um, visual code that represents language as we speak it. And hmm. uh, there's there's an awful lot going on. In, right. let, let me say okay. that about that novel. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hope I'll you look, enjoy I'll it, look, Gavin, when you read it. Yes, I look forward to digging into it. Um, <laughs> maybe it might be less challenging for for me than the appeal because there's one one voice at least. But I'm sure it's one voice. Yep. I'm sure you've considered yep. concealed all sorts of cunning puzzles within it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was thinking uh, when I wrote a novel uh, with one person in it hmm. I did it as a reflection um, an opposite to the appeal hmm. so that I didn't re sort of write the same novel again because yeah. I kind of you're in the same mood and the same mindset you'll know this and I didn't want to do that I wanted something totally different so I just did the opposite. Yeah. Any pressure from the publishers to just give us the appeal 
volume two? <laughs> no, no, absolutely no. not. I mean, Good. Miranda Jewess, yeah. my editor, that's a quite is quite hands off really. She is mm. very good at letting me um, explore um, the stories I want to explore. Okay. And then she's a and fierce editor as well. <laughs> so yeah, she's very that's, good. That's what you need, Julie. <laughs> so um, uh, just to finish off before I run out of time, what's what's coming next? Next, I am just in the middle of the line edits. So that's the second edit mm. uh, that comes from your editor um, for my third book, which all being well, but we are out in January. It's called The Mysterious Case of the Alberton Angels. And okay. it's about two true crime journalists who are mm. locked in competition um, as they investigate um, the same historical crime. And they are both searching for a key interviewee from that historical crime. It, it was a, um, a baby at the time, this mm. person. And uh, now they're 18. It's 18 years ago. Right, they can okay. now be interviewed as an adult. So they are both mm. head to head in trying to get that baby. Okay, fascinating. <laughs> That's all I can yeah. say. <laughs> right, yeah, no, you can't you can't give too much. Um, great. And is Al is Alperton a reference to the uh, West London suburb of the same yeah. name, or is there, okay. absolutely? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm yeah. from North Alt, and Alperton mm. is nearby. I like it because it's basically a big crossroads. Yeah, you've got yeah. three um, roads, actual road roads, and then you've got the canal going underneath, mm. and that's a it's like a transitional place. It's, yeah, it's a strange. Can, anything some, can happen. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, somewhere like Wilsdon or Hanger Lane. It's like a, like this, a place that's yeah. formed by roads and crossings and yeah. junctions. Yeah, places to hide. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great. Place, places to hide in plain sight. That's yes. What we like. Well, <laughs> um, this has been great. I'm sorry it's time limited, but um, no I haven't worries. invested yet oh, in, the, in the expensive version of Zoom that allows you to talk for hours on end. <laughs> Oh, we, can always, we can always do part two, can't we? Yeah, well, we'll keep going until it stops us, because in case I can squeeze okay. something else in. Um, yeah, I just I just wondered if you were surprised by how well the book was received, because um, it was a bit of a stellar success. You know, it's, um... Yes. It, well, I was so surprised, especially because it was launched January 21, uh, middle mm. of lockdown. So there yeah. were no bookshops open, no airports. Um, yeah, uh, and how could it possibly be so successful i think when the paperback came out in july everyone was just getting back to normal and um waterstones made it a thriller of the month um it and that it kind of exploded from there it took off and um i'm so grateful and so surprised thanks very much it's been fascinating <laughs> and uh and yeah uh, thanks likewise. for being the first the first guest slash victim on on this new direction oh. for the channel well, proud and pleased to be so and thank you very much it's been lovely chatting with you yes okay bye then <laughs> bye bye